Hello, my name is Hans George Campbell. Welcome to part two of my Amiga 2000 power supply uh, video. Um, in this video, I'm going to unsolder and remove the original capacitors from the power supply's uh, circuit board. Then I'll, you know, clean the solder out of the holes, clean the board, and then I'll solder on the new capacitors. Afterwards, I'll install the new fan and a new power switch and put the, you know, the power supply back together. Um, I've got a lot to show you guys in this video and a lot to talk about, so let's get started. on my workbench here are the brand new parts I just got them in last week and I have enough parts here to do you know to refurbish and recap all eight of my Amiga 2000 uh, power supplies uh, the two spares that I have this is one of the spares I'm doing today and the power supply that is in each one of my six Amiga 2000 uh, computers this here is are the fans. These are very high quality fans. I'll show these in more detail in a moment. I've got brand new black fan grills. They're the same size as the original, only they're a nice modern black color. They're really pretty, really nice looking or handsome looking fan grills. I've got brand new power switches that I think are really cool because they got the black body and the translucent red switch. It looks really cool. And these are the same size as the originals, including the original uh, lugs where you can just plug in the cables, you know. Um, these capacitors here, they're all made in Japan. Um, they're extremely high quality. They're rated at, they have a, a quality rating of 10,000 hours or more. That's a very high quality capacitor. I mean, for an electrolytic capacitor to have a quality rating of at least 10,000 hours or more, very good quality capacitors. Also, um, while looking for, I, I knew that I wanted 105 degrees C for the temperature rating. But while I was looking for these capacitors, uh, I found out that, that these were also available in 125 degrees C. So these are really high temperature capacitors. They can handle, you know, high temperatures. So these are perfect for recapping an ME2000 power supply. And so, yeah, these are the parts that I'll be using to refurbish and recap uh, the eight Ami 2000 power supplies, you know, that I have. Um, yeah. Okay, that is the soldering system that I will be using today to work on uh, this power supply and the remaining seven Ami 2000 power supplies. Um, that's an OK solder A soldering system. And that is, believe it or not, one of the best soldering irons that was ever produced. And uh, back in the 80s and 90s, um, I used these solder, you know, soldering irons uh, professionally when I worked in the electronics industry as an assembler and an engineer's assistant. Uh, we also use the Weller soldering irons. Those are really good. Um, now, in the 90s, uh, when surface mount became more popular and the industry was switching over from through hole to surface mount, we started using the <coughs> excuse me, 
the Metcal soldering irons, and I'm sure those of you that have worked in the electronics industry you know what I'm talking about. But yeah, that's uh, my old OK solder aid soldering iron that I got way back, I think in 1983 is when I got that. I worked, I worked with a guy, um, I think it was at Kentrox. There's an electronics company uh, by the name of Kentrox, and I think he was one of the engineers, if I remember correctly. And him and I, we were both, you know, involved with the Commodore 64 computer, and so he knew I had extra Commodore 64 stuff, and I wanted an iron like that, like the one that I'm used to using, you know, at work. So I went over, over to his place one night, we were copying software, and uh, I saw that he had one of these irons. He just got it in because he had the company order it for him, and he bought it at company price, you know. I said, hey, I, I've always wanted an iron like that. Would you will, be willing to trade that to me? He said, sure, what do you got for trade? And I said, I'd be willing to trade you a Commodore 64 computer straight across for that iron. And he looked at me and said, deal. <laughs> and so I've, I've had this iron since 1983. And as you can see, I've taken very good care of it. It has been heavily used. And it's still in really good shape, and it still works great. But, you know, I'm sure that the capacitors are going bad on this circuit board. So in a later video, um, I'm going to be recapping that board. And, of course, you guys get to watch me do that. I'll take that that classic uh, iron apart and we get to take a look at how it's made on the inside and I'll recap the board and after I finish refurbishing that board I'm going to put the iron back together and put it back into full service and then I'll take that Heiko you know that Heiko piece of crap right there okay I'm gonna put it back in its box and put that piece of shit away and I'm gonna go back to using a really nice iron like that that's a nice iron trust me the only other soldering iron that I recommend for serious electronics assembly use is, you know, the Weller soldering irons. They're very nice. They're expensive, but you get what you pay for. You know, th those OK irons were expensive, too, back in the day. They were not cheap. They were very expensive. But, again, you get what you pay for. And the thing I really like about this iron, um, it's got, like, your stand, you know, an analog control and you can set it for all the way up to about what 950 degrees Fahrenheit that's very hot of course you got your meter temperature meter there and um, yeah but it, when you go past 700 degrees Fahrenheit you want to make sure that you use high temperature tips do not use your standard silver tip your standard tip you'll burn it up if you go past 700 degrees Fahrenheit Okay, if you ever do that, you might as well take that tip and throw it in the garbage because it has lost its temper. Okay, and you guys know what I'm talking about but when I say temper. The metal is tempered. Okay, those tips there, okay, this is the tip that will be needed um, for, so, you know, soldering on those caps and working on this power supply because it has large um, copper traces that you need to have some more heat. The, the standard tip that I have on there now is about, I think it's a 1.2 millimeter. This is like a 3.4 millimeter. So that's a perfect size for working on power supplies. And this sponge here, this is the proper sponge to use for wiping your tips and keeping them clean, okay? Um, that sponge there, that gray one, this mushy, soppy, soppy, wet piece of shit. This ain't worth a crap for wiping tips. Trust me when I tell you that. I'm a professional. This sponge ain't worth a shit. Pardon my German. That sponge is crap. That whole iron is crap. But that sponge right there, that's the type of sponge you should be using. Because it's much firmer. And, and it does a better job at cleaning your tips. And to give you an idea how long, how much longer these OK tips last, and also Weller's, I suspect is the same, is true for Weller's soldering tips too. I've been using that same tip, this same tip here, 
I've been using that tip for about 15 years and it's still a good tip. 15 years! That 1.2 millimeter and it's still a good tip. Nothing wrong with that tip. Just need to, you know, tint it, wipe it on the sponge. It'd be as good as new again. Same thing with that tip. I've had this tip, this, this tip right here, for over 10 years. And you can see the condition. It's still in really good shape. Now, the average life expectancy for these Haco tips, you know, at $15 each, 15 to 20 bucks each, okay, the, this is already turning black. It's already burning up. It's a piece of shit. Average life of, of a Haco tip, believe it or not, is three to six months. Oh, I shit you not. And if they have the nerve to charge, you know, uh, they have the nerve to charge fifteen to twenty dollars for each one of those tips. I mean, look at this, this shit. Let me get one of these tips out. Yeah, these Hegel tips. I expect better from something that is made in Japan. I expect a lot better. Okay, I expect a lot better. But yeah, that's the iron that I'm going to be using today to recap this power supply. So next, um, I'm going to show you the parts in more detail, and then we're going to start, you know, recapping this uh, this MB2000 power supply. All right. First, I'm going to show you the the new fan that I got and you'll often find I think they're called Nidec fans you'll often find these in vintage electronics and that's how I know this is a very good quality fan and this is the fan that I recommend uh, as a replacement fan for your Amiga 2000 power supply um, it is uh, made in Japan. It is a ball bearing fan. Okay. It has, I believe, the same rating as the original fan, which is 12 volts DC and um, 150 milliamps. Uh, let me double check. Let me put my go uh, magnifying goggles on. I don't want to tell you wrong. So. Put on my magnifying goggles and uh, verify this. Yeah, made in Japan. It's 12 volts DC, 0.15 amp, which is, is ex the exact same thing on the original fan. So, yeah, this is the proper replacement fan. This is the fan I recommend uh, for use in your Amiga 2000 power supply. Do not use a sleeve iron fan. Do not use an Oshawa fan, okay? This is the proper type of fan right here that you should be using, right here. Now, it does come with this type of a plug. That cable is long enough, plenty long enough to plug in to the Amiga 2000 Power Supply circuit board. And it probably works just the way it is. But what, you, what I'm going to do is take off this sleeve, you know, this sleeve right here, and then I'm just going to, cut that connector off, strip back the wires, and here's the original fan. Let me put this that way. Here's the original fan here, and it's got, this is a type of connector that it has that plugs into the PCB. So I can just, you know, solder this onto that wire and just heat shrink tubing, you know, to cover up the connections, and yeah, then I'll be able to just plug right into the circuit board. But I think, judging by the spacing of those holes there, right, it might have, I might just be able to just plug that in, you know, just the way it is. Just see how it plugs in. Because it has, I think the, the size of the square holes is about the same. So I might, I'll try it and see if it just plugs in. And if it does, just leave it like that and just plug it in. Make sure that the red wire you know, goes toward the front. So I'm probably going to have to carefully remove these and swap the wires around. But I think there's room to put it in this way. You know, there's room to put it in this way, plug it in that way, but we'll see. But this is the proper fan, the replacement fan for 
and Amiga 2000 power supply. And that's what it looks like on the other side. It too has the seven fan blades, just like the original. Okay. And you instead of using the clips that they used, you can just use modern uh, fan screws that are self-tapping. You know, you know the type I'm talking about. You can just use those. They'll work just fine. And then... Um, Okay, let me put these away. Here is the fan guard right here. And as you can see, it's the same size as the original fan guard. So it should work. Even the holes here, the mounting holes are the same. So it should work just fine. Uh, I'll take it out of the bag. I think it just, how the hell does it come out? There you go. Come on out. Come on out. <laughs> All right. So that's what the original, I mean, that's what this new fan guard looks like. It's pretty nice. I like the way it's like, it, it, it you know, has like, it's made like that. So make sure the, the fan blades don't hit this, you know, and I think it'll work great and it'll look nice too. I think this will look really nice on the Amiga uh, 2000 power supply because it's going to be mounted like that. Okay, it's going to be mounted like that. And I think that's going to look, you know, really good. I think it's going to look really good. Better than the original one. Okay. All right, next up, I'm going to show you the switch that I got. Um,. This here is the original switch, right here. It's the original switch, okay? And the way I had to remove this, I had to slip a flat screwdriver in there and just pry those open on both sides, and that allowed me to rock it out of that hole. I couldn't do it any other way. It wouldn't come out. But you do have to take this switch out or else you're not going to be able to put that one screw back in because this switch will be in the way. And you might as well do that. How many times has this switch been switched and they have a mean time between failure rate, like so many cycles, you know? I think it's just like two or 5,000 cycles and they start going bad. The contacts start going bad. So it's a good idea to replace that switch. And this is the, the switch that I got to replace it. Same size lugs, you know, so I'll be able to plug in the connection. It's not as long, but that's okay. As long as it clips into those holes when you plug it in, it does. I already tried it. And I thought that the red looked really cool. I mean, if you compare it to the original um, switch, you know, look at that. I think the red looks cooler. I really do. I think the red looks really cool. Yeah, it's the same size, only this has a matte black finish, which I think will match with the black fan guard, because it's matte black too, you know, instead of gloss black. So yeah, this will work really good. When you get these, okay, you need to make sure that it fits into a rectangular hole that size. And what you need to get, you need to have one of these as part of your electronics tools. Um, a steel ruler like this that measures in millimeters. Okay, see how it's got a millimeter scale on that? So this hole, so you can get the right power switch, it's um, about 12.5 millimeters um, this way, 12.5 millimeters that way. And let me measure it. Um, looks like about looks like about 27 millimeters uh, this way. Okay, so make sure you get one that fits a hole, you know, a panel. It's called a panel hole that size. So yeah. And another thing that, another reason why you should get one of these um, rulers here, 
that measures in millimeter is because a lot of times you really should measure the lead pitch or the lead spacing of your capacitors. Okay, one size does not fit all. And one of the things I've seen a lot of you do, a mistake that I see a lot of you make in your YouTube videos, is that uh, you just take any old capacitor, as long as it has the same value, about the same voltage, and you ignore the lead pitch. Don't do that. There's a reason for different lead pitches. You need to also take that into consideration. If you do not have the proper size capacitor with the proper lead pitch, stop what you're doing and order, you know, buy the capacitors with the proper lead pitch. For instance, these new capacitors here, these, I think these are Panasonic's, or wait, well, these are Nichcons. These are very high quality capacitors. Very high quality capacitors. These have a quality rating of over 10,000 hours. Oh yeah, Nichicon. They have a, a temperature rating of 125 degrees C. I don't know if you can see that on the camera or not. 125 degrees C. Okay, and the lead pitch, these have the proper lead pitch. Now before I said they were 8 millimeter because I just took a quick measurement of, uh, from the PC or from the solder side of the board. It looked like it was 8 millimeter. But in reality, if you measure these from center to center, they're 7.5 millimeter. Uh, seven. Well, if you get a lead pitch that's between 7 and 8 millimeter, it'll work just fine. But these are, to be exact, are 7.5 millimeters across, you know, the lead space or the lead pitch. Both terminology, terminologies are correct. These are vented. They are high quality, very high quality Nichicons. Similar to the original Nichicon caps that you will find in the Amiga 2000 motherboards. They were light blue like this. Some of them were darker blue. Um, but I think these lighter blue ones, if you ever see these in your computer, these are very high quality capacitors. The Nichicons with the light blue casing like that. They're very high quality capacitors. And then, okay, that's the 16, excuse me, that's the, come on, focus, focus. That's the 16 volt on the right, and the one on the left is the 10 volt. And that's exactly the way the original capacitors are. The 16 volt is slightly taller. And this is about the same size because, um, okay, what is this one? 105 degrees C. So the ones that were in there, um, they are really good. These were good quality capacitors too. They were 125 degrees C, but they're not Nichicons, you know. And you can tell because they're the same value, same voltage, and yet the Nichicons are a little bit shorter. They're smaller in size because they're a much more efficient capacitor. So yeah, they will be small in size, you know, a little bit smaller in size. All right, the other capacitors that I have, both of these I think are Jamico. Jamico also, um, they make very good capacitors, very high quality. These are made in Japan. These are, I think, the, the 220 microfarad, 35 volt. Um, I'm trying to look at the C rating. Uh, I can't really tell, but I'm pretty sure these have a high temperature. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it at the camera or not, but it's 125 degrees C for these caps as well. Jamecon. Now, these are high quality capacitors. They too are made in Japan. They're very nice capacitors. Very nice capacitors. Very high quality. These are the capacitors that you should be. Uh, installing, you know, when you recap your Amiga 1000 power supply, these are the ones you should be installing. This one too, this I think is, uh, let me see what this one is. It's hard to read that dark blue on a black body. That's 220 microfarad, 25 volt. That capacitor there, it too is a Jamecon. Made in Japan. Very high quality uh, capacitator. <laughs> 
But yeah, so those are the parts that are going in. So now I'm going to um, unplug and put away this Hagel piece of shit. And I'm going to hook up my glorious, my really high quality, super duper, OK soldering, soldering system. And after that, I'll be right back. All right, before I can start the work, I need to change out the tip on my OK solder aid soldering system and just unscrew it. Never use a wrench on this. I've, that's another mistake that I've seen a lot of you make. You use a wrench to tighten that. It's not necessary. Finger tight only. I think this here is a 1.2 millimeter. This is great for for most uh, you know, ordinary, just standard soldering, you know, most soldering of through whole parts. It's even good, it's small enough, it's even good for service mount parts as well. So I'm going to put that tip there, and I'm installing this, I think this is a 3.4 millimeter. And the reason why I need a tip like this is because you need more surface area right here at the very tip. You need more metal to contact um, the copper tracing that's on the uh, that PCB it has a lot of copper tracing and if you find that you're you're having to hold the iron on the, the connection for too long of a period your temperature is either not too high but you're not allowed to, you should never go above 700 degrees Fahrenheit when using a tip like this okay or most likely you've got the wrong size tip there's a reason why there's many different size tips there's a reason for that okay one size does not fit all and you learned this when you work have worked in the electronics industry for as long as I have okay so I'm a professional listen to what I'm saying boys and ghouls I do know what I'm talking about okay now on this type of iron finger tighten only you'll hear it squeak finger tighten only I've watched a lot of dumbasses through the years in the electronics industry, you know, using a wrench to tie it down. And they wonder why this keeps getting looser and looser because it's mushrooming out. And then it no longer will hold the tip in. Yeah. Finger tight only. In fact, when I caught people doing that, I told them one time. One time. Finger tight only. And when I saw them do it again, I'd write them up. And I said, if you do it again and I catch you, you're fired. And I've fired a lot of people from doing that, using a wrench on, on, the, on these soldering irons. Don't do it. It's not needed. Just finger tight and only, that's tight enough. But you see how clean that tip is? I haven't even tinned it yet. That's, you know, I haven't even tinned it yet and cleaned it on a sponge. And yet, look how clean that tip is. That's a tip that's over 10 years old. That's how nice these tips are, how high quality these tips are. Okay? You think that that uh, Hako crap, the tip will stay looking like that for 10 years? Hell no. You'll be lucky if it looks like that after six months. And to show you what that looks like in the package, um, this is what they look like in the package for the OK soldering systems. And there is the number if you want to try to order them. Because these, t these irons are so old now, the tips are getting very hard to find, especially the wider tips. They're getting very hard to find. But that's what the package looks like. That's the number, the SAT number, right there. I don't know if you can read that or not, but yeah. And there's uh, pertinent information on the back. I don't know how well you can read that. Okay. But, yeah, I try to always keep, you know, new tips in stock, even though I probably won't be needing them for another few years. But, you know, when I do need to replace a tip, it's nice to know that I have spares in stock because they're getting hard to find. Getting very hard to find. Okay. Um, I went ahead and recapped 
this power supply off camera. Um, I decided to do it this way because I, I felt that it would be boring for you guys to watch me unsolder the original capacitors and then solder on the new capacitors. I thought that would be, you know, make for a boring video. So I decided to recap this power supply off camera. It turned out really good. These are the new capacitors. You know, these here. New capacitors. Now I decided not to change out the computer grade capacitors and I recommend that you do the same as long as they're not domed up on top and they do not appear to be bulging or leaking there's no need to replace these capacitors they're very high quality capacitors and you usually don't have any problems with these now sometimes you do and one of the signs that a computer grade capacitor is going back is a plastic top you know they're not vented is that they'll start looking like a dome up on top and I show an example of this in my video where I recap one of my Atari ST power supplies and I actually show what one of these look like in bad condition and I show you the new, the new capacitor too so you know what to look for if you have to replace these you know so if you have not watched that video I recommend that you do because in that video I show you what a computer grade capacitor looks like when, it, when the top is domed and if you ever see that, it can happen on the ME2000 power supplies as well, then yeah, that cap will need to be uh, replaced. So now, before I put the power supply back together, I want to talk a little bit about what I did to the case, to recondition the case. All right, this is the top of the Amiga 2000 power supply case. And what I had to do, okay, if you notice, you'll see like rust spots on the top or on the metal, you know, and sometimes the edge will also be like rusted, you know. Um, what you have to do is you take some distilled white vinegar you pour it onto a clean rag. I usually use like 100% cotton makeup pads like this. I just pour a little bit of white, distilled white vinegar on that and wipe down the metal of this case. And you let it sit overnight. You let that distilled vinegar sit on the metal overnight. And what that does, that neutralizes the rust. Okay? And then the next morning, what you do is you fill up your kitchen sink with hot water and Dawn dishwashing liquid, and you wash this case really good inside and out, both the, the top and the bottom part of the case. And you let that dry, you know, you rinse it, I mean, you uh, empty out the water out of the sink, fill it up again with clean hot water, and you rinse these parts really, you wash them and rinse them really good, and you let them air dry overnight. Then the next day, you spray some WD-40 on a clean rag, you wipe it down inside and out, wipe it down with the WD-40, that conditions the metal, it dispels moisture from the metal, and it conditions the metal, okay? Then you take a clean 100% cotton rag and you wipe it down again. You want to wipe off all that WD-40, especially on the inside, or where these vents are right here. And if you do it properly, when you wipe your finger over the top of the metal, it should feel silky smooth on top of the metal. And that's what I did to neutralize the rust and condition the metal of this case. And I did the same thing with, you know, the bottom part. As you can see, it turned out really clean, really nice. It turned out really good. Remember how black and rusty it was right here and it's along the top edge and stuff? Look at it now. It looks nice and clean. Even the bottom is clean. The inside is nice and clean. That's how you want the case before you um, reassemble the power supply. Okay, so now I'm going to do just that. I'm going to assemble the power supply.
All right. Um, let's get this power supply reassembled, shall we? Make sure that you put this Mylar piece back in, and it goes on this side, not on this side. It goes on this side here, right where the power switch is and the AC receptacle is. It goes right here, underneath the high voltage side of the board. Okay? And so we take the power supply board and make sure that when you put this in, that it goes, the board goes right in between those two metal parts that I was telling you about. Um, right in there. Make sure it goes right in between, you know, right in that metal slot. Okay. Alrighty. So we've got that in there like that. And then, uh, let's see, I need to get a low torque number two Phillips screwdriver. And uh, we're going to go ahead and put this back in. Do not tighten the screw until you get them all in. And you want to snug only. Do not over tighten these screws or you can crack the PCB. You can't actually crack this board if you tighten too tight. So, yeah, don't do that. Loose until you get all three of them in. And this is what I'm talking about. It'd be impossible to get that screw back in if you have the switch installed here. So, I'm going to have to use my tweezers to put uh, that one back in. Be very careful with these coils, not to get those messed up. Not to mess, you know, not to mess up that coil. Okay, there's that one. Okay, remember what I said, just snug it. Do not over tighten these. They have a, um, a normal washer and a lock washer in there. And once that lock washer closes, it's tight enough, it'll keep that bolt from loosening up. Okay? There you go. That's in there. Well, let me make sure. Let me make sure. Do not use a full-size number two screwdriver on this. It has too, way too much torque. <clears throat> this is the proper size screwdriver for this job. Okay? <clears throat> All right, the next thing we want to do is we want to reinstall um, these wire, but I don't think they had enough slack before, so this time I want to make sure they have enough slack. Okay. Make sure they have enough slack and that, yeah. I want to make sure they have enough slack this time. And you just basically put those babies, well, in there like I don't know like that okay and make sure they have enough slack and yeah that looks pretty good like like that just make sure it's in there and yeah and that right there plugs in and meets it out motherboard and you got, this is for your CD-ROM drive, uh, hard drive, this is for the disk drives, so, yeah. Okay, so that's in there. And I just want to make sure I can get to the, the jack where the fan plugs in. So, yeah. That part's done. Next, we're going to install the 
this assembly um, right here. We'll install that. Alrighty. Um, this plugs in. It's got a clip on one side, so you can't plug it in backwards. But you just plug it in like that. Make sure it's in there. And then what I like to do is I like to put in you know, put the ground wire on first. And the way you do that, the tooth washer um, goes on first. Okay, there's a tooth washer that goes on there. And then we have Okay, that goes on like that. Then we have your regular washer. I think this is a lock washer. It goes on, and you just tighten this up until the lock washer closes. So you don't want to over tighten this, okay? Yeah, you don't want to over tighten this. like that and let me get the uh, it's a seven millimeter wrench is this seven millimeter yeah seven millimeter wrench and you just want to tighten it till it's snug that's it hold on to the yeah okay Oh, trust me, it'll, it'll be okay. Just snug. That's it. Once that's closed, then that's it. Just snug it. You don't want to break this thing out of this. You don't want to break that. So, yeah, I think that right there is, is good. Okay, that's good. Do not over tighten that. You can break that out of the metal. So that's good. It's in there. Okay, it's in there. Alrighty. And now what we want to do is you want to put the outlet back in. So uh, let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that, and I think uh, the switches for that, or not switches, the uh, the nuts and bolts are those there. So I'm going to need my low torque number two Phillips again. Yeah, going to need that for sure. Okay. So put that in there like that. Now the teeth goes toward the plastic, uh, plastic piece. Now don't tighten it until you get the other one in too. Don't tighten it until you get them both in. Okay, so put that baby in like that, and then we're going to put that in like that, yeah. Okay, so yeah, that should be it. I'm going to use the full size number two just to snug it. Just to snug it. Okay? Just to snug it. And that's it. That's all you need right there. Just a, like, not even quarter of a turn, about an eighth of a turn. 
with the, the full side number two. And that is plenty tight enough. All right. Okay, the next thing we're going to need to do. Okay. Well, I'll do that when I come back. All right. Let's get the power switch put in. Um, okay, that's in there. All righty. That's in there. I did mark the top of one of these with a pencil, which is that one, okay? I don't think it makes any difference, but just in case it does. Yeah, so that goes in like that, and this will go in like that. All right, so the switch is in there like that okay that's that's good yeah so the next thing I need to do is to install the uh, the fan okay we're gonna install the fan now there's two types there's two types of these um, screws right here for fans let me get a different type so you'll see what i'm talking about get one of the other types all right if you look at these i don't know how well you can see it um this one here has more of a flat larger head on it Whereas this one has more of a bevel, like an angle underneath there. This type will not work for this application. You need one like this. And so if you don't have them like this, then what you need to do is you need to use the clips and the bolts that came with the original fan. They will clip over this as well. Okay, I just thought I'd mention that. I don't know if you can see this or how well you can see it, but it's got to have that kind of a head, okay, where it's flat and it's a much larger head like that in order for it to fit onto there really nicely, okay? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to just put it like that. Now for this, I'm going to need a full-size screwdriver, and we're going to put this in like, well, like that. Hopefully I can get it in there. Okay, my neighbors are talking real loud outside. I don't know if you guys can hear that on the camera or not. Do not tighten these until you get them all in. Okay, do not tighten until you get them all in. Okay. So, and you want to hold on to the fan. Okay. All right, so there's that. And it's, okay. That's good. Let me make sure this is, I'll still be able to plug that in. Yeah. All right. Okay, we got that in there like that. I'm going to 
pull it over like this so I can get to it. Just snug these. Do not over tighten them. Just snug them. Just like that. Okay, just snug it. There you go. Snug. 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 And snug. Make sure the fan still turns good, and it does. Okay. So the fan's installed. I just need to plug it in. And there, that's what it looks like. Okay. Yeah. Now, like I said, if you don't have... If you don't have these type of screws, fan screws, then just use the clips and the bolts from the original fan. Okay, those clips will also clip over the new fan. Okay, so now what I need to do is plug this baby in. I got to make sure the wire is tied out of the way. You know what? I'll, I'll do that off camera and I'll be right back. Okay. All right, I got the fan in, and I plugged it in. You know the fan wires where it goes into the circuit board right there, and I wire tied them here. You don't want any wires hitting those fan blades, and it's tied up top here too. And you want to make sure it's tied away from where those those screws go in, especially if you're using the clips and the bolts. You want to make sure this is tied away from there. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and put on the, the top. And if you ever find that the screws are like stripped, the original screws are stripped, what you can do a uh, normal fine thread PC screws will work. They'll actually work. You know, like these type of screws here, these are black. But also the regular, uh, let me see if I got some. Like, you know, your standard, like, PC screws. Okay, they're fine thread. These will work too. They'll work. Okay, and because these are fine thread, you want to use a low torque number two Phillips. Okay. Low torque number two Phillips. Okay. Um, and you just want to snug them. You do not want to over tighten. Okay, do not want to over tighten these babies. Alright, and make sure this is the way it's supposed to go, and it is. I mean, just make sure it's it's in there and it's not coming out, and it is. Yeah, that looks, that looks uh, real good. And then do the same thing to this side. Uh, well...
Okay. And I'll just hold it like that and make sure they're tightened. All right. So that power slide, let me uh, zoom out a little bit. That power slide right there is totally and completely recapped. It's been cleaned. I mean, look how nice these black uh, fine machine thread PC shrews look. They look really cool. They're not stripped. It looks really nice. This is where it's supposed to come out like that. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, that looks good. The vents look nice and clean. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out a, a label that's going to stick here over the part that's in another language. It'll, it'll stick right here on top of this original label, and it'll say, you know, recapped, new fan, and the date, and I'll have my initials on it. And that's what the back looks like. So, yeah, you can see that the new fan guard looks really nice. The fan is in there really nice. Uh, yeah, looks pretty good. Yeah. So, I got seven more to go. <laughs> seven more Amiga 2000 Power Slides to go. And all the power, all eight of my Amiga 2000 power slides will be done. Anyway, <clears throat> that's it for this video, this two-part series. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. Anyway, stay tuned for more exciting content here on the Hans Campbell Show. My name is Hans George Campbell, and until next time. <laughs>